In the first video, we saw that we could actually take our DWG files into Illustrator and start to work with them. However, the easiest way that we tend to do uh, the whole process of bringing drawings and working with them in Illustrator is to create PDFs. And this has many advantages. The one, one of them is that you can actually print a PDF using black lines and with the line weights from the CTB file. So that we are automatically will have when we bring our drawing into Illustrator. The other advantage is that we can actually print to scale and Illustrator will maintain that scale when we bring our, our, bring our PDF into Illustrator. So first what we need to do is we need to create a plot from our DWG file. So here I have the same file open in AutoCAD and if I set my plot up in the printer dialog, Control-P, I'm going to print to PDF I can print it on my letter, uh, page size, so if I know that I'm doing an 11 by 17 format, I can fit to that. If I know that my drawings need to fit on um, 8 by 11, I can work with that, or even Arc D, which is 24 by 36. So I figure if I have a 24 by 36 board of drawings, maybe my, my plan would fit, you know, maybe on 11 by 17, so I'm going to choose that as my paper size. And then what to plot, again, I typically use extents, and I always center the plot. And then here is where I can set my scale. So I know that this plan works about 16th scale. Okay, you'll see that it works pretty well. So I'm going to hit escape. And I'm just going to make sure that my CTB is where it needs to be. So I'm going to go into my styles manager. And I will load in my CTB file into the Styles Manager so that I know that I have my corresponding CTB file with my file. So I'm going to go find that, <coughs> and I will copy it, and again, you know, just type in style. Uh, I'm going to type in Styles Manager again just to get the folder up again, and I'll paste it into there. So that now, when I go to print, I can go to my previous plot and point it to my CTB file, which if it's not in there right away, I'm going to close out of that and open it up again. There it is. And then I'm going to print my file. In my file, I'll save it on my desktop. And then in the meantime, I'm going to open up Illustrator. So here I have Illustrator open again. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open my PDF. So I'm going to go to File and Open. And I'm going to find my PDF. And so what happens is this brings in my print okay, on an 11 by 17 sheet, and it brings it in with black lines and line weights, as you can see. So that's the good thing about the PDF is that it actually saves, saves us that step. Now, in order to um, you know, adjust our document, okay, if I go to Document Setup, I can edit my artboard, and I can click on the horizontal, the landscape, format so that I can switch it there and then I can select my objects and I'll use the rotate tool which is underneath your eraser down in your toolbar here and I can hold down shift to constrain it to an angle and rotate it okay so right now this plan is on an 11 by 17 sheet at 16th inch scale so that's the other advantage of using a PDF as opposed to just opening a DWG in an Illustrator file because as we saw before it fit the drawing to the artboard okay whereas we actually printed this to a scale and now we can scale off of it and we can have accurate scale drawings as long as we don't scale it up and down um, according to you know our whatever we do in Illustrator so here what I usually do is I usually keep all my my uh, lines 
okay, my line art essentially on one layer, okay? And I always lock the layer because what happens is that when you start to use tools like the pen or the line, it might start to pick up on these endpoints that you see by default. Illustrator is picking up, okay? So here you, you see if I mouse it over, it says anchor point in green, okay? And that's kind of like, in a way, that's like the object snaps in AutoCAD, okay? Where it's recognizing the endpoints. Um, and a lot of times what happens is if you're drawing over these files, okay, uh, it can pick up these lines and then continue. And it can get a little hairy and a little bit frustrating. So when I do this, I usually keep all of the drawing information on one layer, and then I click on the space next to the eye, and that actually locks it. Okay, and this is good for two reasons. Okay, one reason is that it locks this. Also, the other reason is that when I create a new layer and drag it underneath, okay, all of my fill information will be underneath the lines. So that's uh, graphically an advantage. And to do that, there's a few ways that we can start to add our fills. Okay, one way is to use the tools. Okay, uh, you know, you have your rectangle tools, you have uh, your circle tools, and they're all located here. Um, you'll see there's rectangle, rounded rectangle, ellipse, polygon, stars, so on and so forth. But a lot of times what happens is that we use a custom type of shape. And so for that, what I use is the pen, which is located you know, up above a little bit further. Now, before we use the pen, what we should de define is basically the stroke and the fill colors. Okay. Now, because I already have lines, Okay, I usually choose none for my stroke color, and then I'm going to click on my fill color, and, you know, we can give it a color if we want. Um, there are swatches that are, you know, are sometimes already loaded in, in um, Illustrator, and if you want, you can actually get color books, okay? So if I click on this tiny, tiny little icon in this palette, um, in this panel, uh, in the upper right-hand corner, it looks like a bunch of lines and an arrow pointing down. If I click on that, um, you'll see that down towards the bottom, it starts to mention things about the swatch library. So if I mouse over that, you'll see that it actually expands this swatch library um, into essentially these color groupings. So you have art history, you have celebration, you have the traditional color books, which um, are, are your um, Pantones, etc., you know, your focal tones. You have color properties, and so they put together a lot of swatch libraries for you. Um, I'm just going to click on a Pantone, let's say, you know, CMYK coded. Okay, and you'll see that there are a ton of colors associated with that. Okay, so really the sky is the limit. Um, we tend not to get too crazy in terms of, um, you know, our colors. You know, we'll pick a color, you know, for specific rooms, specific spaces, you know, to determine or, you know, define um, the dining room versus, you know, back offices, circulation versus living spaces, so on and so forth. Um, but let's say I want to start to uh, add some poche, okay? And I'm just going to click on a muted gray color. And when I click on that, that actually updates my color in my um, fill box here, okay? So I can get rid of that. And also what it does is it adds it to my swatch library so that I can actually call it up at a later time. To add the color, I'm going to use my pen, and I'm literally just going to click on these points that Illustrator recognizes. Now these, um, and I'm just going to do a little bit, a uh, little area, to give you the you know the idea of doing this. Now what these uh, points are, okay, and what auto, uh, Illustrator is snapping to, okay, is essentially these points that are set up in this smart system. Okay, so if you go to view and you go to smart guides, you can see that, you know, there are ways that you can turn it on and off. Um, you can, you know, put guides in there if you want, but by default that should be on, okay? And it allows you to start to snap to points. And the nice thing about it is that because this layer is underneath my line layer, I don't have to be precise about it, okay? If I drag that layer on top, you'll see that, yeah, it starts to get a little bit hairy where things are, okay? And that you have an inconsistency between these line thicknesses. So that's why I always put it underneath. Um, you can always add and delete anchor points, okay? You can take your direct selection tool and you can click on an anchor point and you can stretch it, okay? And there's also additional options underneath a pen 
where you can add anchor points, delete anchor points, so on and so forth. Okay, another really, really good tool that Illustrator has is what's called their live paint. Okay, and for this, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to unlock the layer with my uh, drawing lines on it because I need those in order to define some areas, and I'm going to hide this fill layer. Okay? And the way that this works is this is a really, really great tool because it allows you to do things very quickly and very easily in Illustrator. So your live paint is actually located underneath the shape builder tool. Okay, it's a little bit hidden, and it's called your live paint bucket. Okay, and then what I want to do before I use that is I want to select the objects that I am going to be defining these areas. Okay, so this is it essentially paints into a region, so it's almost like a hatch with the pick points. Um, what we have to do before we use it is we have to select all of our objects, our lines, and then if we click on the live paint bucket, if we mouse over an area, okay, it allows us to click inside the selection once it's made. Let's make it that gray again. And now you'll see that when you get the red outline, okay, that's when it actually recognizes the region, and then all you have to do is click, and it'll fill in the space in between, okay, that region in between. So it is a very, very helpful, very time-saving tool, um, and it's an also a great option that Illustrator has. If I want to create some custom patterns, in Illustrator using an image or something, I can also do that too and I can create custom swatches from that. So say for example that I want my uh, flooring okay, to have um, maybe like a, a nebula type of uh, pattern to it. So I went to Google Images and I found some images of nebulas okay, and I can pick one and right click on it, go to copy image, go back into Illustrator and paste it in there, okay, and I can scale it down just using the grips in the corners and holding down shift in order to constrain my proportions. And what I can do is I can actually take it and I can drag it and drop it into my swatches so that it added that and I can get rid of my image. And then now I can set it up use uh, for my uh, fill color by clicking on my fill, clicking on that swatch, and then again just making sure that it's on the correct layer and I'm going to click on that image and then I'm going to change my stroke to none and then I'm going to use my pen tool in order to trace where that image goes. And If it doesn't come up the first time what you can do is you can actually click on this and then click on the image. Okay, so either way, you can either set the image first, this is being a little bit tricky, but I can always change it afterwards. And so here you see that I have created this nebula, and then I can use again my direct selection tool in order to stretch these points. Okay, but you have to select the point when it's white and not black. Now the issue is with this is that you can't really control as much where the image goes. Okay, so you'll see that even though oh, I lost some lines there because that should be locked. Okay, that's exactly what I was talking about before and how you can lose stuff. And if I ever need to change something from one layer to another, so say this got caught on this layer, I can, there's a little uh, icon that shows up to the right of the layer name and I can click and drag that to a different layer and then lock the line layer. So anyways, so that you can see that it has this uh, these seams here, okay? And that's because we don't really have a lot of control over where, um, you know, this image is, okay? So what we can actually do is, you know, it looks, you know, yeah, maybe you want that, maybe you don't, okay? A lot of times what happens is that you search for Google Images and you search for um, images with seamless, okay, or tiled after it because um, people do this often and so what they do is they try to um, they try to work with images, okay, in order to make them work as a pattern, okay, but have seamless edges so that you don't really notice that. What you could also do is you can go back into your 
swatches and you can drag that swatch back out and you can rescale it okay and then drag it back in and what it does is it creates a new swatch but with that new scale so that I can click on that click on the second one that I created and you can see how it shifts okay so you might need to do it in little batches now the thing is it's not just exclusive to that one instance how ever if I do this again okay or if I do it again you'll see that it actually is continuous so that's another issue to you know take into consideration it's not perfect okay but you can actually get it to work and work really well and if you find that your patterns are too much okay you can select them and up above you can change the opacity and you can make them lighter okay now just keep in mind that when you do print this out it's actually going to most likely look a lot different than it looks on the screen um, so you might need to do some back and forth but it's a really nice way of adding some textures into your um, illustrator file okay into your pdfs and your plans in a way that autocad can't really do that